Please be seated. So there's a real contrast in the readings today. Um, in the first reading from Acts, we hear that Peter is consumed and, and driven by the Spirit. Uh, people have called the book of Acts the Acts of the Spirit because the Spirit is so present in the stories of what the apostles do in that book. And in this reading we heard today, Peter can't even sleep without being disturbed by the Spirit. And in his dream, uh, uh, someone from Macedonia calls to him and says, please come to us. And he feels compelled to go. And we hear this story of getting on one boat after another and making their way day after day around the Mediterranean to Macedonia where they meet Lydia. Okay? And, and, and so there's this sense of action and activity and response to God and to the Spirit. And then at the end of our Gospel reading, we have that beautiful passage from Jesus that it's, it's, it's so precious to me, that, that notion of peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. What a contrast. And yet both are true. Both are a part of our experience of God and our response to Jesus. Last week we heard that beautiful commandment. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And as I mentioned last week, this is at the end of that passage around the Last Supper where Jesus does something startling, something shocking. He takes off his, his gown, his, his robe, and he wraps a towel around his waist and he washes the feet of the disciples. It was a very uncomfortable moment for them. And you hear it again, and it's Peter in that case. He says, Lord, you will not wash my feet. He just, it didn't feel right to him, right? And yet, and that Jesus does that. He washes the disciples' feet, and then he says to them, so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And then he goes on to say, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And I think it's very valid to connect those two readings that Jesus is illustrating for us in the washing of these beloved friends' feet, how he loves them and how we are to love one another. Last week, um, I told you the story of two people who had devoted their lives to God in, in, in their youth. They made professions, one of them to, a Je to the Jesuit order, and he became a priest a Jesuit priest, and ultimately he felt that because of who he was that he could no longer stay in the church. He could no longer keep the vows that he had made because he saw a conflict between the way the church treated people like him as a gay man and the way he loved God. And, and he just didn't feel that he could love God and be a Jesuit priest and be who he was, and so he left, and he, he felt that he had lost God, and he had lost church, and for years, for many years, he did not return to the church, until one day someone invited him to a very special service. It was a, it was a marriage service. It was in 1994, and it was a, a blessing of a union between two men. 
and it happened at St. Paul's Church in Seattle. And this was a pretty out there thing to do. It was very controversial. In 94, that was a very controversial thing to do. But what it did was it revealed to Richard, the person whose story I'm telling, it revealed to Richard that God could love him too, and that there were people who loved each other in such a way that he could be included in this community of God's love. And it sort of turns that notion that we love one another as Jesus has loved us around. Um, it, instead of thinking about how do we love each other, it challenges us to think about how do we love those who have felt excluded, those who have felt judged, those who have not felt the love of God around them when they've attended church, for whom church has not been a safe place to go. This week, Jesus says to us, those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. It's this beautiful continuation of that commandment that we love one another and it's the process, promise that in the process of loving one another, God will be present for us. And so when we commit ourselves to being a safe place where everyone, regardless of their struggle in life, regardless of who they are or who they love, whether they're rich or poor, black or white, when we create a place where they can come and experience love with us and from us, we are enacting that command that Jesus gave us. And in the process of doing so, we are making real the promise that God is present to us. But it comes back to that contrast that I pointed out at the beginning, that sort of frenetic sense of Peter being driven by the Spirit from one town to the next until he makes it to Macedonia where the, the Spirit has promised him that someone needs his help. Between that and the promise of peace, Jesus saying those simple, beautiful words, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. And I think that in this world that we live in, there's so much activity, there's so much trying to get our attention, there are so many things asking for us to respond to them and attend to them, that we feel as though the only real way to respond to Jesus' love and to this, pro to this commandment that we love one another is with activity, as Peter did. And I think there's a place for that. We have a feeding ministry on Tuesdays, and we have our worship on Sundays, and we have our choir on Thursday nights, and we have our uh, classes on fasting and other such things on Sunday afternoon noons and on Wednesday nights and and we do all of these things we have these programs we have our morning prayer every morning at 8 a.m. with people gathering on zoom to say the daily office together and 8 p.m. to say Compline together a lot of activity a lot of action and the world we live in is just like that. It's demanding our attention. Have you ever had the experience of getting into, the, you know, you walk into a room and you realize you've left your phone behind? Um, I have to admit, I'm just a little bit addicted to my phone. I can end up in the kitchen and realize that I've left my phone on my desk and I think, <gasps> what will I do? <laughs> what will I do if I have a moment, a pause, a break between my activities and I don't have a phone in my hand to check Facebook or the news. I like to check BBC.com. I, yeah, I like, you know, anyway, because it doesn't tend to be quite as depressing as the New York Times, although not much better. And so there's this sense that, that there's so many things that are demanding our attention here and there, and they're actually designed to capture our attention. Um, the, the, 
Facebook is specifically designed to capture your attention and keep your attention with this little reward. Scroll a little bit down and you get another story and another picture and another image of someone else's ideal life and another picture of that ideal product. If you could just have it, you would be happy. And so there's this constant rush to activity and to attention and to gathering attention. And yet, Jesus says, love one another, and then he says, peace. Peace I give to you. My own peace I leave with you. There's that wonderful story in Luke's Gospel of uh, the Good Samaritan where um, Someone asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? And instead of defining who our neighbor is and how to judge someone whether or not they are worthy to be our neighbor and therefore worthy of our love, right? Because you are to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's my neighbor? Who do I have to love? And instead of defining that, Jesus tells this story of being a good neighbor. He doesn't explain to us who is a good neighbor and who is worthy of our love and attention. He tells us how to be that loving, attentive, neighborly person. And I think there's a similar thing happening here between the activity of living into God's love and the ministries that we are called to and the Christian practices that feed us and that peace. And the problem is that the world around us is so focused on activity that we think that in order to love Jesus, we have to have a new Christian practice. We have to read more of the Bible. We have to do this or do that. And if we do the right thing, then we will have that reward of knowing that God is with us. But maybe, maybe it's not that complicated maybe it really is as simple as peace. Maybe it really is that in the peace that Jesus offers is the love that he offers. And maybe in that experience of peace, we can find that reassurance of God's love. And so I want to, I want to finish my sermon by offering you an experience. This experience is, um, it's a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you into a moment of meditation, okay? I'm going to sing a little chant and, and ring a bell, and between the, the words and the singing and the bell, we'll have some silence. And I invite you, if you're comfortable while I'm doing this, to close your eyes and just sit and be attentive to your thoughts, your feelings, whatever happens is fine. You don't have to empty your mind. Whatever you think of is fine. And then I'll ring the bell again and I'll sing a chant. And this chant comes from Psalm 46. In Psalm 46 it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake, in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult. And then the verse that I'm going to use is, is verse 10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. That verse goes on, I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. Now what I want to do now is to offer you about a minute and a half of peace. And this is the peace that Jesus was talking about. In the quiet, in the silence between the bells, listen. Listen for the presence of the Holy Spirit among us. I invite you to sit comfortably now, and, and if, if you would like, you may close your eyes. You don't have to. 
but it might be uh, comfortable to do that. It's a, a safe place. We will just be quiet and together in this room for a moment. Be still and know that I am God. Sitting quietly, simply listening. And we hear the words that God speaks to us. Be still and know that I am God. The peace that Jesus promises is available to us. It is present. It is in our silence. It is in our prayers. Be still and know that I am I invite you to take a deep breath. Feel your breath entering and leaving. Be still and know Know that you are the beloved children of God. Be still. Be still, and in the stillness, in the silence, trust that God is present and active within you and among us. Be Be who you are, a beloved child of God. Be the love of God. Amen.